Hello again guys, Mr Kinnear here with another video lesson for National 5 Biology. We're on Unit 3, Life on Earth, and today's lesson is about distribution of organisms. In the last lesson we talked about biodiversity, which is the variety of life, and that can be within a very small environment, or you could talk about it over the whole planet. And within the planet, we've got a variety of different ecosystems which have different conditions and therefore different organisms that live there. So we're going to start to talk about the factors that affect the survival of a living thing in its habitat. And you can group those into two distinct groups. And we'll start with biotic factors. So bio, again, meaning life. So these are living factors. We'll start off with grazing. So again, obviously animals eating plants, the more uh, they graze, the less plants that live, and the same with predation. So again, lion, there's more lions, uh, there's um, more chance of the prey being eaten, so there's less prey. And again, we talked about that last week, that goes up and down in a cycle together. Um, food availability, so again, the amount of food that is available to organisms impacts on how many of them can live. Disease, which is again caused by living uh, things. So again, more disease means less chance of more organisms living. And competition. Again, we talked about that last week. So competing for resources, for mates, all of those things affect the chances of survival. And if we've talked about living factors, we're going to talk about non-living factors. So bio for living, and we're going to say abiotic factors are non-living factors. And these are things you've come across before. So temperature. So obviously, various different organisms have different temperature zones which they are comfortable living in. The amount of moisture available to them, and that could be plants. It could also obviously be animals. Light intensity. So again, that will impact on uh, the plants that can live there. But if you think about um, some reptiles which require light uh, to heat their bodies and therefore uh, be active, that also impacts on the at pH, so you've talked about pH in your previous science lessons, the acidity or alkalinity of soil or water will impact what can live there. And things like wind or current speed. So um, again, flying about in high winds can be a problem. Um, some animals require uh, still water to live in. Um, some require fast moving water. So again, all of those things, the biotic and the abiotic will impact on which organisms live within the particular environment or habitat. So one of the things we'll do when we're back in school is thinking about measuring abiotic factors. So again, the different environments we have, even around school, will differ in terms of their abiotic factors. And how do we know that? We could do that by measuring them. So in National 5, you will need to know how abiotic factors are measured, uh, but also what errors can be made during that measurement and what solutions you could give to those problems. So simply, light intensity is measured by a light meter. And one thing you could do by accident is shade the meter. You can stand uh, and create a shadow over the light meter. Now a tree is normally in that environment and therefore a tree shading the light meter is standard. That's how it would normally be in that environment. You standing there shading the meter will obviously cause a problem. So you need to make sure your shadow does not land on the meter and therefore you're taking an accurate reading. Moisture, again, this is not rocket science, is measured by a moisture meter. And one of the problems we normally see is you get excess moisture on the probe. So you're gonna sample maybe beside the pond and then sample in the wood. Now, if you don't clean uh, the moisture meter probe uh, between those two readings, then potentially obviously you're getting the wrong reading when you go to the wood. So you need to wipe the probe between readings. Thermometer is for measuring temperature. And one of the key things we see on a regular basis is holding the bulb of the thermometer. So you can see this person here in the picture um, holding the bulb, and therefore that will give the incorrect reading of temperature. So if you hold it at the side away from the bulb, then you will get the correct reading. A pH, uh, you use a pH meter. You could also use um, things like universal indicator or pH paper. If you take some soil and put it in a beaker and you can get a solution. Um, but you can also, just like the moisture meter, get excess moisture on the probe. Uh, so you just need to wipe that in between uh, different regions. So again, if you're going from one area to the next, 
wipe it in between and you'll get an accurate reading of that um, abiotic factor. So you need to know that, um, what you need to measure them, uh, what errors can be made and what solutions there can be to those problems. So now that we have measured the abiotic factors in the various areas around the school, we can do some sampling, so finding what is living in those areas. We can start then to do a correlation between the abiotic factors and the distribution of organisms in those various places. So these are some sampling techniques that we normally do in and around school, um, and we'll come back to those when we are back in school. Tree beaten is a simple one. You have a white sheet, you hold it underneath a tree, and then someone comes along with a stick and shakes the branches, and then uh, organisms fall off the tree into your sheet so you can identify them. Problems being is that some organisms fly away. Uh, not every organism falls off the tree. It can latch on or it's burrowed within the branches. Um, and also as well, we're not always able to reach the top of the trees. So it's not an even check of what's distributed around that tree. So different organisms can live at the top and the bottom of the tree. So it's not um, always successful at giving an accurate uh, sample of what lives in that tree. Second one is kick netting. That's for streams. As simple as case of getting your wellies on, taking a net into the stream and you shuffle or kick your feet about on the bottom of uh, the stream that kicks up the different organisms that are buried at the bottom there and they then go into the current and then into your net. Problem being again, not everything goes into the net. Some organisms are scared away and therefore can escape your clutches of the net. Next one is pooters and that's good for sampling things from trees and shrubs that are at your normal height. Um, but it is unfortunately very selective and you can see from this uh, picture it's got a two-way straw mechanism. So effectively what you're doing is you're, you're sucking on one straw, which sucks an organism off a leaf and into the jar. It does have a bit of mesh to stop anything going from the jar into your mouth. But it does mean that you go along and go, oh, there's something there, I'm gonna sample that. And it's not as random um, as the tree beating option. Next one up is something you're probably familiar with. It's pitfall traps for sampling what lives on the ground. So what we do, we go along, uh, normally with the yogurt pot, we dig a hole, put a yogurt pot in, make sure that it is level with the ground, and we give it some time for organisms to come along the ground and fall into our trap, and then we come back and discover them and identify them. Again, problems we have is birds eating them, so we need to make sure they're covered effectively. Sometimes we leave them for too long, so some organisms get eaten. And what we normally find is we find a spider at the bottom, and if a spider gets into your pitfall trap, it's going to eat everything else that's in there. It's got a free lunch buffet. But also as well, just putting it in properly. If your trap's not level with the ground, then it means that things can't just fall in randomly. Um, so that is then another problem. And the last one is a quadrat. So that's about sampling what plants live on the ground. It can be selective. So you need to make sure you throw your quadrat randomly. Again, not enough samples is often a problem, so you need to make sure you throw it um, quite a number of times to make it a good sample of the ground. So here's a quick example of how a quadrat can be used. I'm going to give you an example that this is a one meter square quadrat, and I've got a playing field that is a hundred meter square area. Now, if I was to say to you, go and measure how many daisies or white flowers or on that playing field, that could take you all day. But in this simple example, in this one meter square box, I've got four daisies. Um, so I could say by correlation then, um, in one meter squared, I've got four daisies, in a hundred meter squared, I'm gonna have 400 daisies. Now, one of the problems there, that one quadrat sample for that kind of size is not big enough. So I'd have to do more samples. Another uh, error could be that I go, oh, there's some daisies, I'm going to throw the quadrat at them. So again, I need to have lots of samples and I need to make sure throwing the quadrat is random. So I think at least 10 um, different samples uh, from that quadrat to make sure it's a good average. And again, if my average number uh, per one meter squared was four, then I could see quite categorically that my estimate is that's 400 uh, different daisies or white flowers on that playing field. I could also say 
abundance of grass. So in the summertime, the, the grass on the playing field should be in really good condition. So I can see from this quadrat that every single one of my uh, shapes within the quadrat has grass in it. So that's 100% abundance. Now, again, that's just one sample, one throw of the quadrat. I'd need to make sure I did many more before I can say safely that it's 100% abundance. Again, I'd need to make sure it's random. So I'm not just selecting the bits that have grass and totally ignoring the bare bits of uh, brown ground without any grass. So that's two ways of using um, a quadrat to understand the numbers and the abundance of different plants on a particular area. Now that we have sampled our environments, uh, we have a bunch of organisms we need to identify. But how do we do that? Now, looking at those four pictures there, you might think, oh, it's a fly, a wasp, a butterfly, and a ladybird. Um, but there's huge amounts of different species. So how do we really identify the exact species of the organism that we have found? I will just do that using keys. And there's two different types of keys, a branching key and a paired statement or dichotomous key. We need to go through both of them. And these are things that will come up in test um, to um, allow you to identify different organisms based on the information that has been provided to you. So the first one is a paired statement key or dichotomous key as it's often referred to. Um, it's simply a case of a list of statements paired together. And you start at statement one and you follow the instructions until you reach the answer. So we're going to start identifying this bug B. Okay. And the statement one A is wings are covered by an exoskeleton, or one B is wings are not covered by an exoskeleton. So I can't see the wings, so they are covered by an exoskeleton. So I go to statement two. At two A, body has a round shape. It does not have a round shape. Body has an elongated shape. That is definitely it. It is therefore a firefly. And again, um, let's see if we can identify C. So wings are covered by an exoskeleton. That is not the case. Wings are covered, not covered by an exoskeleton. It's definitely that. So I go to step three. So in this instance, I just completely miss out step two. I go to statement three. Uh, wings point outwards from the body. That is true. Um, so that therefore is a dragonfly. Now, many of you will know that A is a bee and D is a ladybird. But um, you may be presented with things you've never heard of before. And if you just follow the statements, looking at the stuff that you can clearly identify, then you can definitely find out what A, B, C, D are without ever knowing anything about them previously. So a branch key looks something like a family tree, uh, but instead of people, it is different questions and you go left or right, depending on the answer you want to give. Now, this first one, leaf has prickles, it's a yes or no question. You can also get things like, if you're talking about people, hair colour, eye colour, and therefore, instead of yes and no, you might have a branch that says blue eyes, brown eyes. But in this instance, it's got leaves have prickles, so we're going to start off with one. Um, leaf has prickles, so in this instance, this is no. Uh, we then go to leaf has a smooth edge, and those edges are smooth. So we're going to go yes, and leaf has lobes, so just like ear lobes. So again, this leaf definitely has um, different lobes around it. So we're going to say yes, and that therefore is an oak leaf. Again, many many of you might be familiar with the oak leaf, um, but that definitely is an oak leaf, and we've established that. The next one, um, leaf has prickles. Again, that's a no. Um, does it have smooth edges? So in this instance, it's got quite rugged edges. So we're going to say. No, we're going to go down here. Um, and again, leaf has lobes. Um, it certainly does. That therefore is an L. Now, the one thing to notice here is that um, this question, leaf has lobes, is here twice. And that is fine. So, for instance, because um, We've gone through the process of leaf has prickles. We've gone through the process of leaf has a smooth edge. So we've already separated elm and sycamore from beech, willow and oak. So I can ask the same question. Leaf has lobes on both sides 
whether it has a smooth edge, yes or no. And that allows us to make distinctions. So you can actually ask the same questions on different branches of your branched key. So say, for instance, I was talking about people in the class. I could make the first statement being um, male or female. And again, the next question for both groups of so male and female could be eye colour. And again, those people wouldn't mix because they're already separated out into two different groups. So blue eyes, brown eyes on male and female sides of a branch key. And that would work. And again, obviously, you just go through the process of each of the leaves till you find um, all your answers. So we've gone through the process of sampling an environment. Uh, we've identified the organisms. Um, in biology, we can use some organisms as what's known as an indicator species. So an indicator species is um, an organism whose presence or absence can tell us about pollution levels in an environment. So for instance, the burning of fossil fuels, um, coal and oil releases sulfur dioxide into the air. And obviously that sulfur dioxide will then impact on what lives within that local environment. And one of the things we use in a, very often in biology is lichens. So they're a group of plants which are sensitive to the presence of sulfur dioxide and therefore um, the presence or absence of different lichens could tell us about the sulfur dioxide or the pollutants within the atmosphere. Now, obviously, you could buy sophisticated equipment to tell you about the sulfur dioxide content of the air, but in terms of biology and without racking up a huge amount of cost, we could look at air quality just by looking at the lichens that are in and around the school environment. So there's two ways of using lichen as an indicator species to measure air quality. And this is something we've done in and around the school on a regular basis. Good news is that we do have really good air quality around the school, even though we've got a major road uh, coming from Aberdeen and heading west. Um, the two ways is about the type of lichen. So leafy lichen is only found in areas where there's really good air quality because the pollution kills it. And if you find lots of the different species, then it gives you an indication there's a little sulfur dioxide pollution. And on the other side, you've got crusty lichens. Now they do like heavily polluted air, so they survive quite regularly in poor areas of air quality. And again, if you find very few uh, different species, then again, it gives you another indication of the air quality. So huge amount of biodiversity in terms of lichens and particularly leafy lichens, good air quality, um, very small amount of different species and particularly the crusty lichens means you've got the really poor air quality. And what we find in and around the school is that the leafy lichens are predominant. You might find more crusty lichens as you go towards the road. So the outskirts of the wood on the uh, roadside will probably be crusty and less uh, of them. But as you go away from the road uh, towards the school, you'll find more leafy lichens and more different types. So that gives a really good indication that, uh, particularly in the school grounds, we've got some really good air quality. And you might find them in and around your garden at home. Another area where um, indicator species can be used to detect pollution is in fresh water. Now, if you're ahead east towards Aberdeen from um, Aboyne, you'll find uh, in Schmarlow, they've got uh, a sewage treatment plant. Um, so obviously that's dealing with the waste uh, from our homes. Um, now, if you have a problem there, then what might happen is that it might release sewage into the River Dee, which is obviously a problem uh, for us and for all the organisms that live there. Uh, what it is good for is bacteria. So they get a huge amount of food. And if they get a huge amount of food, then obviously they increase uh, but when they do increase, then they use up the oxygen in the river. And that's bad news for the other organisms that live there. And obviously that then has an impact on the biodiversity and the quality of life that we find in that water. Obviously means it's probably not worthwhile going swimming in there. So let's put that into a graph form. So as you can see here on the y-axis, we've got the number of bacteria um, and the oxygen concentration. 
Okay, so that's going up as you go up the y-axis. And you've also got distance downstream. So obviously the stream is going that way. And if this is an example of inch marble, then it'd be going towards Aberdeen. So before the sewage treatment plant, we've got very low pollution, which means um, the bacteria number is low and the oxygen available is high. The unfortunate thing is that there has been an accident at Inch Marlow and some untreated organic waste has been added to the waterway. That immediately uh, sends a change in the system. And as you can see, our oxygen levels are decreasing and immediately our bacteria levels have increased. Okay. The good news is because we're actually moving downstream in this direction, that eventually uh, the bacterial levels decrease. So say for instance in Aberdeen, down here, our water is back to normal with high levels of oxygen and low levels of bacteria. So that's great. The problem unfortunately is right here where it's happened, where the biodiversity of our stream will be massively affected due to the lack of oxygen available. So that's a massive problem. And the one thing that uh, biologists will use um, is indicator species to tell you about the quality of water um, in and around different places like sewage works, like um, uh, farms, um, different factories that might release water into streams and rivers. And here's some examples of uh, indicator species that you might find in fresh water to tell you about the quality of the water. And again, many of these we have found within the pond um, in the school grounds. So stone fly nymph, mayfly nymph, freshwater simp, uh, caddis fly larvae are all things that we have found regularly in that pond telling us that the quality of water is really good. So there's low levels of pollution. Thankfully, we have never found that awful sounding name rat-tailed maggot or sludge worm um, in the pond, which would indicate that it's really high levels of pollution. Obviously, again, like we just discussed in the previous example, bacterial levels would also give you an indication of the water quality. Or if you were able to sample um, the oxygen concentration, those things would give you an indication. But that's a bit more complicated. Just looking in the water and finding stonefly nymph, mayfly nymph, and all those things in really high abundance would tell you water quality really good. At the bottom of that table, finding lots of water lice, uh, sludge worms and rat-tailed maggots, again, would immediately tell you the water quality is bad and there's a problem here. So that's indicator species and how we can use them in biology. So we've gone through a lot today and that is us. So distribution of organisms in a habitat is affected by both biotic, which are living, and abiotic non-living factors. We can identify different organisms that we find through sampling uh, by branch keys and paired statement keys. And we've also talked about indicator species, which is a species with a presence or absence of it can give you an indication about the pollution levels of their environment. The two examples we've done is air quality and water quality. So that's us. Hopefully you found that informative and engaging. If you have any problems, questions or queries, give me a shout and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye.